We've now seen a variety of different types for expressions. Some of them are atomic types, like int, bool, or float. Others are composite types, types that are constructed from other types. These are types like our tuples, lists, and option types. These composite types allow us to build data structures using two methods. The first method is conjunction, where we construct a new value from components by combining all of the components. In an int cross bool cross float tuple, we need all three parts, an int, a bool, and a float, in order to construct a new value of this type. The second method is alternation, where we construct a new value from components by just using one of the components. A list, for example, could be constructed with one of two alternatives, nil or cons. An option, similarly, could also be constructed with one of two alternatives, none or some. These are all what we call algebraic data types, data types that are built using conjunction and alternation. Lists, tuples, option types are all built-in algebraic data types, but OCaml also gives us the ability to construct our own algebraic data types. Imagine, for example, we wanted to write code to work with DNA sequences, which are long sequences of four different amino acids, represented by the letters A, C, G, and T. How would we represent a single DNA base in a program? You could imagine that we could just use a string type to represent a DNA base, with each string containing just the single character for the letter of the base. But there's a key problem with this approach. A string could take on lots of possible values, not just these four bases. There's nothing stopping us from using a different letter like B, or even a multi-character string if all we're enforcing is that a base's type is a string. The possibility of representing some illegal state opens the door for possible bugs in our program. If our code is only designed to handle the four strings A, C, G, and T, we need to be very careful not to ever let a DNA base take on any other value and get into some illegal state. It would be much better if this kind of illegal state just wasn't possible at all. This is what we call the Edict of Prevention make the illegal inexpressible. To follow the Edict of Prevention, we need to find some alternative structure for representing DNA bases, one that doesn't even allow the possibility of an invalid base. We can do that through what's known as a variant type, where we define a new type by a set of different ways to construct that type. In this case, instead of using a string for a DNA base, we can define a new type called base and say that a base has four different value constructors, one for each of the base letters. These value constructors represent four different ways to construct values of type base, and the vertical bars are how we separate the alternatives from each other. If we enter this into the OCaml REPL, we now have the ability to work with this new type base. If we use any one of these value constructors, we've expressed a value of type base. That value could be named in a let expression, just like any other value in the language. And notice that now the illegal is inexpressible. There's no way to define a value of type base that isn't a valid base. If we use anything other than one of the four value constructors, we'd get an error. So if we have a value of type base, we know for certain that it's valid. Just like any other type, we can define functions that work with values of this type. For example, in DNA, every base has a complementary base. A and T are complements, and G and C are complements. So we could define a function to return the complement of a base. We first match the base, and we can use each of the four variants as a different pattern. Depending on which variant we match, we can then return the complement. So this type works great for representing a single DNA base. But what if we wanted a type to represent a sequence of DNA bases? Taking inspiration from the list type, which could be the empty nil value or the cons of a value and another list, we could similarly try to define a type for DNA sequences. We'll define a type called DNA as a variant type. It'll have two variants, nil and cons. But when the variant is cons, we would then want our DNA sequence to store a particular base as well as a remaining DNA sequence. It turns out that variants in a variant type can take an argument of a specified type. 
This allows variants to build composite values out of other values. We can do that by adding the of keyword after the variant and then specifying a type. In this case, something like base cross DNA. This is now our type for a DNA sequence. A DNA sequence has two possible value constructors, nil, which represents an empty DNA sequence, and cons, which takes an argument of type base and another argument of type DNA to combine a base with another DNA sequence. We can then construct DNA sequences of this type. A DNA sequence might be an empty sequence, just nil. It might be a sequence with a single base, which would be represented as cons of a base and a remaining sequence nil. It might be a sequence of multiple bases, represented as cons of a base and a remaining sequence which itself is cons of a base and a remaining sequence, and so forth. We could now define functions that work with our DNA type. We could write a function first base that gets the first base out of a DNA sequence. We match the DNA sequence. If it's nil, it has no first base, so we can use the fail with function to raise a failure exception. But otherwise, if it's the cons of a base and another sequence, we can just return that first base. We could also write a complement function to take the complement of a DNA sequence. The function would again work by first pattern matching the DNA sequence. We know that our DNA type has two value constructors, nil and cons. So if the sequence is nil, then the complement is just nil. And if the sequence is the cons of a base B and a remaining sequence, then the complement of this whole DNA sequence will be the cons of the complement of this base B, and then the complement of the remaining sequence, computed recursively. What if we wanted to write a function to take the complement of the first base of a DNA sequence? That is to say, if a DNA sequence had a first base of A, then our function would return T, the complement of the first base. We could implement that by calling our comp base function on the result of getting the first base of the sequence. As we continue working with functions, passing outputs of functions as inputs to other functions, you might notice that there's a minor readability issue with the way we normally write sequences of functions. What the code is doing, start with the DNA sequence, get the first base, and then take the complement, is in the opposite order from how we would read the code, where comp base is written first, then getting the first base, then the DNA sequence. This is a result of the fact that in OCaml, like in many languages, functions come before their arguments. This isn't too much of an issue with just these two functions, but you could imagine it getting harder to read the more functions we're applying. Fortunately, OCaml provides us with an operator known as the backwards application operator that helps in cases like this. The backwards application operator lets us have an argument before the function. So to take the successor of the number three, instead of using the function name and then the number, we could have the number, the backwards application operator, and then the function. What that lets us do is rewrite our sequence of functions in a way that's more readable. We start with the DNA sequence, then we apply a function to get the first base, then we apply a function to get the complement of the first base. It's more readable now because the order you read the code is the same as the order in which the functions are applied to the data. So all of these functions we've just written work with this DNA type that we've defined, where a DNA sequence is either nil or cons of a base and another sequence. Of course, since we can use the built-in list type in OCaml to make lists of any types, we could have instead defined our type DNA to be a base list, and that would have also worked for a type for dealing with sequences of bases. But what this exercise has shown us is that even if OCaml didn't give us a built-in list type, we would have been able to construct it for ourselves. In fact, many of the built-in composite types provided by OCaml could have been implemented using the kinds of algebraic data types we now know how to write for ourselves. For example, the bool type we could think of as a type with just two variants, true and false. The polymorphic alpha option type could be defined as a type with two variants, none and some with an argument of type alpha. And the polymorphic alpha list type could have been defined as a type with variants nil 
and cons of alpha and alpha list, a value and then a remaining list. The ability to define our own data types is an incredibly powerful tool that lets us create precisely the right data structures for whatever our program needs to work with. Let's take a look at a few more examples. Say, for example, we wanted to represent a dictionary in OCaml. Dictionaries are data structures that map keys to values. You might think of a real-world dictionary that maps words to definitions. But in programming, dictionaries could map any kind of keys to any kind of values. We might map countries of the world to their capitals, for example. How would we create a type for a dictionary? Well, a dictionary is going to need to store all of our keys, which are all of one type, and all of our values, which are all of one possibly different type. So let's define a polymorphic type alpha beta dictionary two type variables, because we want one type for the keys and one type for the values. And we'll let it be a record, where the keys are a list of type alpha and the values are a list of type beta. We're using the letters A and B in the names of our type variables, but the names actually could be any arbitrary names we choose. So we could be a little clearer and name the variables after what they represent, the type for our keys and the type for our values. This type we could then use for representing dictionaries. To create a dictionary value, we would create a record with a list of keys and an equal length list of values, where the first key corresponds to the first value, the second key to the second value, and so on. As it turns out, this type we've just defined is not a good way to represent dictionaries. It has a major problem. Namely, a dictionary should always map every key to a value, but nothing enforces that in the type we've just defined. We could create a dictionary value where the keys list is longer than the values list, and we have an illegal dictionary. Recall that according to the Edict of Prevention, we should make these illegal states impossible. A better way to implement dictionaries would be to define each dictionary entry as a record of its own with a key and a value. Then a dictionary could be a list of those dictionary entries. Now it's impossible to create a dictionary with a differing number of keys and values, a much better design for our type. Let's consider another example. A useful application of algebraic data types is to create types that capture languages. Here, for example, is a simple language for arithmetic expressions written in bacchus naur form. An expression is an integer, or the result of taking two expressions and applying a binary operation, like addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division, or taking the negation of an expression. How could we define a type for expressions like these? Well, each of these lines in the grammar could become a variant. We could define a type for expressions with one variant that just represents an integer, one variant that represents adding two expressions, one that represents subtracting an expression from another, one that represents multiplying two expressions, one that represents dividing an expression by another, and one that represents taking the negation of an expression. Using this type, we could create values that correspond to different arithmetic expressions, and we could even write functions to manipulate those expressions. And to take one final example, one other common data structure is the binary tree where nodes of the tree branch off into left and right subtrees. Each node stores some data, maybe an integer, maybe a string, or any type, really. So we could define a type for polymorphic binary trees. Every tree is either empty, or it's a node that stores a value and also has a left subtree and a right subtree. Using the type we've just defined, we could take a hierarchical data structure like a tree and represent it just using the value constructors for our binary tree type. So algebraic data types give us a lot of flexibility to define exactly the type we want through the mechanisms of conjunction and alternation. As our programs get more complex, algebraic data types help to ensure that we always have the appropriate type for the problem we're trying to solve.